This edition of Computer Club Lesson was recorded on September the 14th, 2015. Enjoy! Welcome everyone to our second season of Computer Club Lesson. In this lesson, we're going to go back to the very basics. We're going to start with the keyboard. I'll be answering your questions, and we'll talk about what's going to come up in future lessons of Computer Club Lesson. Hello. Welcome to Computer Club Lesson. This episode is brought to you by the Binary Guys. Okay, let's uh, start off, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for coming. This is the biggest class we've ever had. Yeah. We'll see how many of you turn up next Monday. Um, okay, how many are new people? Please, show of hands. Lots of new people. Okay, uh, I am told that some of you are interested in uh, iPad. Raise, raise your hands. Okay, everybody's got iPads. Of those people that have iPads, do you also have a Windows type computer? Okay, only one. Okay. The challenge. Step us now. Yeah. Will it be a different set if you have uh, just a tablet? Um, no, no. We'll try and answer your questions as we go about the tablets. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an iPad myself. I'm, a, I'm an Android guy. But um, I'll. Uh, as a matter of fact, if, you, um, if your tablet is acting up, please bring it to the class and we'll try and repair it on the spot. Or if there's something you don't know, I can demonstrate to you and demonstrate to the class just how easy uh, okay, my iPads are. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, with that said, um, it's time to begin. Um, for you, those that don't know me, my name is Bob. I have a company uh, in town here called the Binary Guys. And one of the guys is uh, my grandson, James, who used to work with me, but no longer works with me because someone is giving him a lot more money than I do. <laughs> but, but when he has time, he loves to come and teach a class. Okay, I'm told that um, Fred has gotten a lot of requests um, for some simpler stuff than what we've been doing over the last year. Um, okay, let's start at the very beginning with technology that is basically 160 years old. That is your keyboard. Stop and think about it. The typewriter was invented 160 years ago or more. Okay, so this is 160 year old technology. And it's the input for your computer, but it's also, if you're using a typewriter, the input to put ink on paper. Computers do that, they just do it in a very roundabout way. But this is it. Now, for those of you that are relatively new to computing, this keyboard does a lot of things that your mouse will do. And it does it faster because it's just one keystroke or a combination of keystrokes where you might have to look around um, in, in a you might have to look around in an application like a web browser and go through all of the um, go through all of the inputs that are underneath here to find what you want to do print and make a new file and save something it's all here on the keyboard and they're called keyboard shortcuts The best one to do a keyboard shortcut is the F4 
five key. F5. There are function keys across the top and they're labeled as F. And the first one that you're going to want to know about is F5. There's no particular order to these. But F5 is called refresh. So if you have something on the screen and you got you need to make sure that it's it's going to give you a new, uh, an updated version of what you have on the screen, an updated version, you can refresh the screen. As a matter of fact, you can refresh a window or you can refresh the entire screen if something went wrong with it. If, if you get a black box in here somewhere, the, the, the computer has lost its mind a little bit and there's a black box there, if you just hit F5, it refreshes the entire computer screen for you. Okay? Refresh, it's very, very, very handy. Um, here's another one you might want to write down. ESC, and it's always in the same spot. Escape. Escape. Okay? Um, if you're viewing a video on your computer and you're viewing it in full screen, you can view it in full screen. It turns out that there, not very often is there a button in that full screen to stop the video and make it go back to normal window. Escape. Okay. Escape does a lot of other stuff too. but. Uh, that's, that's one of the functions for it. Um, F11. And this one comes in really, really handy. F11. If you have a web page up on your computer screen, and you're having a little trouble seeing it, things are a little small for these tired old eyes, or your glasses need to be adjusted or whatever, F11 makes a web browser window full screen. Boom! There it is. You're playing a game or you're inspecting something, uh, something on the page and you want to see it more clearly. F11 makes the, the web browser full screen. Okay. And to get out of it, uh -huh. press F11 again. again. Okay. okay. F11 manipulates your web browser from full screen to regular size. <clears throat> That's not right. I might have to reboot this, sorry folks. Um, okay. Now there's some, there are some other buttons on a keyboard that you need to know about and one of the first ones is the Windows button. Okay, It's usually um, situated between the control key, the alt key and the space bar. So if you look at your space bar, the next one is alt, the next one should always be the Windows key. The Windows key does some great things for you. Uh, what it does is if you press on the Windows key in just about every operating system except for Windows 8, it will give you a menu of what's on your computer. So if you press the Windows key, this will pop open, a menu, to show you what's on your computer. Now you can find what's, you can find your computer hard drive, you can find all of the documents that belong to you, and it's, it's uh, subbed into documents and pictures and music and videos and whatever else you like to have. Um, and usually, it's subbed also into the programs that you use the most, like your email and your internet browser. You'll find them in this list, or you should do. If you don't, it's configured improperly. Okay? Yes? 
Is this Windows 7? This is Windows 7 on this computer, but um, I'm not going to talk about Windows XP anymore. Oh, why? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, show of hands. Who's still using Windows XP? I don't want to say those <laughs> All right, I'm sorry, folk, um, but. I am no longer supporting Windows XP. <laughs> it is just too damned hard. Microsoft doesn't support it. I can't get the drivers for it anymore. If, it, if you make it go away or you damage it, I'm sorry, it's done. Okay, we fiddled with this for too long. 13 years is long enough. <laughs> okay, Windows 7. Uh, Windows Vista is the same. Uh, Windows 8 is different. And now we come to Windows 10, which everybody should, we'll talk about after a little while. Uh, we'll also give you this start menu back. Hooray! Yeah. They learned their lesson. Okay, so that's the Windows key. Now, the control key right beside it will do some things in combination with other keys. Okay? In combination with other keys. The control key in combination with two very specific keys will help you um, copy and paste and cut and paste items from one place on your computer to another. And it's extremely quick. So let us take, for example, I have a folder here called desktop holder. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. And I'm tired of having it here on my desktop. So I want to put it in my owner's folder. This one right here. So there's our desktop holder. And I want to put it in my owner's folder. This is really easy. You just click on it and highlight it. Control C. Open this up, control V, and it has copied that folder and its contents to a new location. It's that quick. Two keystrokes and you've done it. And you can do that for text, for individual files, for individual folders, just about anything that you can name inside of your computer, you can move it from one place to another with two keystrokes. Control C, copy, control copy, control V, paste, copy paste. Control X is cut. That means that the folder would disappear from the desktop and appear in the owner's folder as I just did it. Control X, Control C, and Control V, paste Control X and Control C. All right? Now, if any of this is going whoosh, we are making a video of this entire lesson, and you will get it in email, and you can go back and you can look at it as many times as you like until it's there. But it's relatively simple. Who didn't get it? Okay, who didn't? <laughs> Honestly, folks, come on. I'm not don't, don't, tease <laughs> don't tease me. Don't tease me. Okay, so that's the control key. The alt key also does some things in combination with another key. And the most useful one is Alt, tab, alt, tab. If you have five or six um, items open on your desktop,
or even two or three or four. You can use the Alt tab, the, the Alt tab combination. So you would hold down the Alt key and just tap the tab key. I'll do that now. Hold it down and tap. See what it's showing me? It's showing me that I have Internet Explorer open. If I tap it again, it shows me that I have Chrome open. If I tap it again, it shows me that I have my libraries folder open. If I, so if I tap and I get my uh, Internet Explorer, uh, it's showing me that it's there and it's open. If I let go of the tab key, it comes to the front. You don't have to go looking for it. It just comes to the front. The same thing if I alt tab my libraries folder, I let go of the tab, and the library folder comes to the front. You've got three or four different programs open, or even three or four different folders open. And it's really good for folders. If you've got three or four folders open, you can just zip through those folders no problem at all one right after the other and in combination with control C and V you can copy stuff from one folder alt tab 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 right folder control V bang it's pasted no more roaming around with your mouse looking for this window to close it or to bring it down to the bottom so you can see what's in behind it okay it's that simple. Please go home and play with these. Play with them. You can't hurt anything. Open up four or five different windows and use Alt Tab and see how quickly you can move through them. Where's the tab key? Or did you say there was a special the tab key? The tab key is located on the left side of your keyboard, usually underneath the number keys. Okay. Thank you. okay. Now the tab key is a throwback to a computer, or uh, I should say, uh, a typewriter keyboard. You can set a tab, and if you press the tab key, then the carriage will move to that place. Press it again, it'll move to the next place that you've set. In the computer, um, we'll do the same thing uh, when you're using uh, a WordPad or Microsoft Word. And you can also set that to go to the far right, go to the middle of the page, whatever. It can be set, but it's usually set with, with uh, 10 spaces. Okay, so you can hit the tab, 10 spaces over real quick. Okay, but the alt tab combination is what you really want to use to move through your computer quickly. And if you're moving through stuff quickly, guess what a computer starts to be, folks? Enjoyable to use. <laughs> it does. No more, eh? It does. It becomes enjoyable to use because you're not sitting there trying to close windows and bring windows up from the taskbar and navigate through a bunch of stuff that's, you know, in the way. You can bring all these windows right to the front with one click. What, uh, alt tab. Is that the same as your shift key? The shift key does some other things. Okay. We'll come to that. Now then, one thing about these keyboards is that the early keyboards were for people who were not used to keyboards of any kind. And the older keyboards like this one had the word enter right here on the right of the keyboard. They have the word enter. Okay. Most new keyboards do not have that word. They just have the arrow as a down and across arrow. 
what the what the enter key was was really the carriage return okay so if you press the carriage return the carriage would um, it would move down to the next line and throw the carriage back this does that electronically okay it was usually labeled as return okay not enter but on the computer the, the they wrote the word enter on that key. On modern keyboards, in most cases, it's not there. It's not there. You have to look around for it. And where it will be is it will be amongst two keys together. The enter key and underneath it a shift key. Now, on a typewriter, the shift key moved you from small letters to capital letters. Okay? This does the same thing. It also has a key called cap locks. But if you hold down the shift key and tap a letter, you're going to get a capital letter. Will it stay for the next? It will not stay for the next one unless you hold it down. Okay? And it was the same with the shift key. You had to hold the shift key with your pinky in a big heavy carriage and tap the next letter to get a capital out of it. Then when you let go, it went back to lower case. The cap locks is really a shift lock key. For those of you who still remember your typewriter had a shift lock key. That just simply locked the shift button into place. So you had all caps. Now, those are mainly the ones that you're going to use as you're moving around your computer except for one other combination. And that combination on a Windows computer is the three-fingered salute. The three-fingered salute is Control-Alt-Delete. <laughs> now, I'm going to do Control-Alt-Delete, and I'll show you what it does on this computer. Control-Alt-Delete. And it takes you back out of the computer almost altogether, so you can get at things like being able to turn your computer off, log off your computer, get to the task manager, very important. We'll talk about that in a few, in, in a few lessons. But what it does is it allows you to gain control of your computer. If you've lost control because the thing lost its mind, and they do it all the time, if you're using your computer, some, at some point or other, it will lose its mind and you'll have to get control of it. Control-Alt-Delete, the three-fingered salute, allows you to get to the task manager, which shows you that everything that's running in your computer, and if something is not responding, the computer will lock up. Or the program will lock up, and you won't be able to use it anymore. The task, the task manager underneath, uh, behind the control alt delete combination will allow you to close that non-responsive program. And so you can highlight it, click on end task, and there it went away. If it was unresponsive, it would take a minute or two, but it would go away, allowing you to get control of your computer again. Okay, It does happen, even on the newest ones, on older stuff, it happens all the time. On new stuff, it still happens. So control, alt, delete, the three-fingered salute. Um, now, um, there are a few more buttons that will help you navigate around in your computer and these are the arrow keys. A computer or a, uh, a typewriter usually doesn't have arrow keys because it's got to move the 
uh, the carriage, so it doesn't have them, but on a computer keyboard, it has arrow keys to allow you to move the cursor to any places on the, on the page you're viewing or throughout the computer um, where if you want to easily navigate to the next thing. Okay, uh, arrow keys move you around inside of documents mainly. Um, there is the delete key, which um, on a typewriter would be for a special typewriter that has a whiteout ribbon in it. You click on delete, it goes back one space and whites it out. Backspace is quite another thing. It just moves the cursor back one space. It doesn't really make anything go away, it just moves it back one space. Uh, backspace also, if you have Internet Explorer open or Google Chrome Backspace, will go back through your history. So let us say you have, you've gone through 10 web pages and you want to go back to one you know was three pages ago. If you uh, tap the backspace key, it's like hitting this arrow key up here, which takes you back pages. But the backspace key also does that. So you don't have to be mousing up to your arrow up here in Internet Explorer, your back, your, your back a page arrow, just hit the backspace, back it goes. Quick, easy. Now, uh, how many have laptops? Show of hands. Okay, how many have laptops with, the, with a number pad on the side of the keyboard? Okay, mostly all of you do on modern computers, it's there. Sometimes this number pad is buried inside of the letter keys. And if you look closely, you'll see that the number keys are in blue or red, sometimes yellow. And this function, key, there will be a function key down here. It'll say FNC with a blue line, a red line, a yellow line underneath it. When you tap that function key, it activates a number key. It, it, chain, it remaps the keyboard. Instead of having uh, I as a letter, I becomes a number. O becomes a number. P becomes a number. Okay? And to get out of it, you just tap the function key again, and you're back to, to normal. You can also use the number keys across the top. But uh, a, I've, a couple of instances I've had to go to a client's home and undo what they've tapped on the function key and locked it. And now they're typing along and in the middle of what they're typing is numbers. <laughs> and they can't get out of it. You remap the keyboard. Mm, that's not a bad, that's not a good thing to do. Okay, just about every uh, keyboard on a computer has what's called a print screen. Okay, up here. Print screen. Yeah, print screen is a very, very old command. Extremely old. It's 50 years old, going back to the time of um, computers that were as big as a building, okay, mainframe computers. Print screen on a mainframe uh, in what, if you've ever seen it, would be a command line. You hit print screen and it remembers everything you did and prints it out in a line, okay, <coughs> print screen. But, so if you're in command line, yeah, you'll use, per, you'll use print screen, but that's the only time you'll ever use it. Pause and break are for 
programs on your computer that are called macros. In other words, you can set them up to do a series of things. Two things, three things, ten things, thirty things. A series of things. The same. Time after time after time after time. So you hit the macro key, or the, the, the keys that you've set to run the macro on the keyboard, and it starts to run it, and it's doing line after line after line after line, exactly the same. At some point you want to stop that. That's what you use the pause key for. Okay? These are keys that you will seldom ever use, but they are there on a modern computer keyboard. Any questions about keyboards? I know you've got some. Please feel free. By the way, um, there are two kinds of keyboards and they're still in use. This is a USB keyboard. It has this flat square um, connection to the computer. There is the PS2 keyboard and it's round and it has little pins inside of it that connect to the computer to a round port. Okay. The USB keyboard you can plug into any running computer and it will start to work. So if something happens to the keyboard on your laptop you can go to the store, buy a cheap $15, $20 keyboard, bring it home, plug it into the laptop. You have a working keyboard. It's just that simple. You don't have to do anything but just plug it in. A PS2 keyboard is quite different. The computer has to be off and you have to plug the computer or plug the keyboard in when the computer is off and then start it because it will not recognize that keyboard until it recognizes it in its very earliest boot up stages. Okay, PS2. Um, the same thing, by the way, for a mouse. There are two kinds of mouse. There's the, P the uh, USB mouse, plug it in, it works. The PS2 mouse, you must start the computer again to get it to work. By the way, the PS um, the, the uh, PS types of connectors are faster than the USB type connectors. Gamers love PS2 keyboards. They love PS2 mouse because it's much, much faster inside the computer than USB. When I say much faster, we're talking um, thousandths of a second, but for a gamer, that's a lifetime. <laughs> okay. Um, that's the main parts of the keyboard. Um, like I said, go home and play with your keyboard. You cannot wreck anything. Uh, open, a, open a document or, or uh, make a new document. Play with your keyboard, find out what all of these things do. And um, if you want to go on the internet, just uh, go to a Google page and type in uh, list keyboard shortcuts and you'll get all kinds of pages that tell you what uh, keyboard shortcuts work and which ones are special for games. There are special keyboard shortcuts for games. But you'll get a list of all kinds of them. And, but these are the ones that you'll use all the time if you get used to using your keyboard rather than your mouse. Your keyboard is a lot faster than moving around with your mouse. And as I said before, a faster computer use is a more enjoyable computer use. You're not sitting there scratching your head. Where is it? OK. I think we've pretty much beat that to death. Um, 
So I will take questions. Do we have questions? Yes, ma'am. That's entirely up to you. And you have to ask yourself, what will I be using this computer for? If you're just going to use your computer to navigate through a few web pages, do a few searches in Google, um, do some email, and your eyesight is good enough, by the way, because the, that's, that's a statement. Your eyesight has to be pretty good because uh, tablets are small. That means that the, 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 the resolution of the screen is, is really good, but that doesn't help you if you can't tell an L from an I. Okay? So you have to have relatively good eyesight to use a tablet. But what are you going to use it for? Okay. So that, there's the first question. If it's just for those simple things, might I recommend a tablet? Um, for anything more complex, like creating documents, um, altering documents that you might get from your friends, okay? Um, if you have specific hobbies that you want to do, or you just simply want to play games, then go for a computer, a full-on computer. Can you, you use a printer with a tablet? You can, but it's difficult. And for you iPad users, yes, there is, there is a program that will allow you to use your iPad with a printer. I'd have to go looking for it, but I know it can be done. It can be done on an Android tab and tweet Android tablet as well with a special program. Perfect. Yes. I have Windows 8.1 for my sins. Should I be looking at Windows 10? Let's talk about <laughs> Windows 10. How many of you uh, during our break took the upgrade? You took an up the upgrade oh, to no, I mean I've, oh. I've upgraded. Yeah, I did. I, I tried to. I got Windows 10. Yeah. I tried to. It kept saying it's work working. You know, like it's, uh, you know, it's spinning, trying to do it. Okay, it was trying to do it, and you got nowhere after a right. few hours. Right, right. <laughs> okay, and yours worked fine. After uh, an hour, it was done, yeah. right? Yeah, it was done pretty quick, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've run into that with a few other clients. That's why I am not ready yet to say, okay, go ahead. If you have the upgrade, click on Upgrade Now. I'm not ready yet. Maybe by the end of the month, I will be. Okay. Yes? Can I remove the XP from the computer and put it in a Windows 10 operating system? Um, probably not, because your computer will not have enough horsepower. Enough? Horsepower. Um, everything inside has been upgraded. To what? <laughs> um, I would have to look at it, but you would it least need a dual core processor Got it. and at least two gigs of RAM, preferably four. Probably got it. Um, 250 gig hard drive. That I don't know for sure. Yeah, well something hard over an 80. Never, yeah, something. Hard drive has a, that's the only part yeah. that hasn't been changed. Yeah, well I, I would suggest to you then um, that to, if the computer is good enough to go out and buy a new hard drive, have it installed, and then have Windows 10 installed on it, and it's going to cost you 150 bucks. It's not free. 850? 150. Oh, 150. Plus the, uh, the hard drive, um, maybe $90 installed. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a computer that's good enough to do Windows 10, sure. But in your case, because you're you have Windows XP, the upgrade is not free. You have to buy a legit copy. Mm -hmm. So what do I need? Uh, two? I would say a 250 gig hard drive anyway. Make sure it has at least 4 gigs of RAM and it's a dual core processor. Yeah, that it is Pentium dual core. Yeah. 
and it should work. My, my computer did not get offered that. You have Vista. That's the problem, eh? Yep. Okay. <laughs> yes. Sounds to me like it would be cheaper for him to buy a new computer. It might be. It might be. Um, at that price, you're more than halfway to a new one. Okay? You're more than halfway. Um, a, 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 a desktop tower can be had for about 400 bucks. I don't recommend them. Mm -hmm. But. You prefer the laptops? Well, no, I, I don't recommend something in the $400 range. No. I recommend that you uh, husband your pennies and go to somewhere in the 600 to 750 dollar range. That gives you uh, a nice graphics card that will support um, the latest monitors that you know you've probably got an old monitor hooked up to it but if you want to put a nice brand new monitor on it uh, the graphics card has to support it um, and stuff like that as well as your future proofing your investment. If you buy a computer today, your that computer will probably last you somewhere between nine and twelve years. Um, if you upgrade what you have, you may get another three years out of it. Okay. So a, a new tower would be six hundred too. Yeah, I I would say that you're looking in that range around six hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at a laptop, seven hundred dollars minimum. Yeah. And a Macintosh would be more. Oh yeah. Yeah, but if you have Mac stuff now, if you have if you have uh, the iPad, iPad 2s. Yeah, um, and uh, what's your phone? Is your phone? Uh, uh, do you do you have a uh, smartphone? No. Oh. Well, if you ever want to go that route, if you ever want to go that route, you can stay in the Mac ecosystem by getting an iPhone. Yeah. And you don't have to buy a new one. No. You can buy one that's two years old. Uh, um, a five, you can pick them up for about 200, 200 250 dollars uh, from a reputable used phone dealer, and um, you're golden. Now, this uh, new tower for 600 is that uh, Macintosh or? No, no, that's a PC. Windows. Okay. That's a PC. Uh, uh, a Mac Macintosh, you're looking at a minimum of 1200 bucks. Now, what is and that's what's for? called an all-in-one, by the way. There is no tower. It's all in the big screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So you get a new screen, too? Yeah. yeah. Big one? Yes. 22 inches, at least. Maybe 23. Um, and let me tell you one other thing about Macintosh before we leave this. If you are into photography, if you have a decent camera, and you want to save your pictures on your computer or save them to some other resource like a cloud so in case something happens to the computer you don't lose them. Mm -hmm. The Macintosh screen is stunning and it shows you real color as close as you're going to get to what the camera took. In the PC world those monitors are always darker Okay, so you, um, the blacks are muddy, the browns are muddy. Uh, if you're taking a picture in full sunlight, it doesn't look like it. It looks like you took it on a cloudy day, <laughs> stuff like that. Okay, the, the Mac screen, the, the Mac definition of the screen is closer to what you see in the real world from your camera, as well as printing. Okay, so. Let's uh, leave the Mac world for now. Yes? I still have one more question. Yeah. Would it take any Windows type of programs? Let's say I went to a Mac from, you know, from Windows 7 and there, my not Yeah. Windows. There is a way to do it and what you want to do is buy a powerful Mac. Uh -huh. um, and um, because the latest versions of the Macintosh computer are um, based on uh, PC components, 
you can trick the computer into running full-on Windows 10. Okay. You can trick it. That would be nice. There's two ways to do it. You can run Windows 10 inside of its own window. Okay. So you're running two things at once. You're running OS 10, and then with, uh, with a little keyboard um, shortcut, all of a sudden you're in Windows 10. The new one, the new iPad yeah. Pro or something, did you see that show? That no, I haven't, I haven't gone. Yeah, I haven't gotten into the to the iPad Pro uh, mainly uh, because um, I haven't had the time. And the other thing is that I heard that uh, the best the best of them is a thousand dollars. That's an awful lot of money. It starts at seven ninety nine. Yeah. Lower gigabytes. Yeah, but the best of them, something that would work, is a thousand dollars. But let's face it, it's a tablet. It's a tablet. It's not going to do those computer things that you might want to do. As I said to the lady before, um, think about first about what you're going to use it for. If it's just those few simple things, yes, tablet's fine. And the portability of them is just absolutely great. This is a tablet. It's a five inch tablet, but it's a tablet. Um, and for the most part, I consider this tablet to be my office. Okay, everything that I need to do is on that phone, and I can have my office anywhere. Um, so, like I said, think it over what you want to do. If if you're fortunate enough to be able to do both, then you have one other decision to make. And in your case, you have that decision to make. You have an iPad. Do you want to stay, go jump fully into the Macintosh ecosystem? Because it's very difficult to make that iPad talk to that Windows computer. It can be done, but it's difficult. If you go with the Macintosh ecosystem, it's there. It'll talk to it. The same thing if you're going to buy a PC and a tablet or you want to buy the tablet first and you think you might want to upgrade your PC, then um, if you want to do a Microsoft Windows tablet, okay, the Surface tablet, stay in the same ecosystem. Is it Android? No, Android is quite another matter. Um, my telephone and my tablets are Android. Um, but um, because I'm a geek and I play with them every day, I know how to make them do things that they would not ordinarily do. For the average user, uh, it's going to be a struggle. What about BlackBerry? Does it interface with uh, Windows and with Apple? No. No? no. There are ways. There, your BlackBerry is a very particular kind of animal in that right now, the only thing that you would that is really, really good about an, a BlackBerry tablet is its messaging function and its secure messaging function. Um, other than that, there is no reason to have one. And I cannot trust, I cannot tell you that BlackBerry will be a company making hardware six months from now. Will it be supported? Who knows? It doesn't have much. I we have Blackberries, and it doesn't have much consumer customer support. In fact, zero customer support. But when it works, it's brilliant, and it you know it does do a lot. Yeah. And it's got a big keyboard, which is important for some people who have large hands and not yeah. such good sight. Yeah. So, yes, they do have their place. <laughs> but uh, if you're a consumer with a BlackBerry. Um, you really do have to know a lot about them to make them work to their or fullest. Somebody who does. Yeah, uh, to to make them work uh, to their fullest potential, and that's among the other reasons why I would would say stay away from BlackBerry. I mean, you want to support that that Canadian icon, but folks, I'm going to tell you, six years ago, Research in Motion BlackBerry screwed up. 
And they did it in such a way that nobody could tell them. They wouldn't listen. And I'll tell you the exact day when everybody knew that BlackBerry had screwed up, Research in Motion had screwed up. They had a press and investors day about six years ago. And one very courageous lady reporter stood up and said, Blackberries are great, I just love them, except for one thing. When are you going to make apps that don't suck? <laughs> well, she got her candy ass tossed out of the meeting for that question, but every reporter in the room was asking the same question and didn't have the guts to stand up and do it. And from that day on, BlackBerry knew that they had a problem, but they did nothing about it. Their apps sucked. Android worked better. And it was just brand new on the market. Uh, its first iterations, buggy and crashy, but it worked better as far as the apps went. Nobody could tell them. They deserved to lose their company the way they did because they wouldn't listen. That's my rant for today. <laughs> I have one of these every week. Just come for the rant. Yeah, they gave you the opportunity. <laughs> you owe me back next week. <laughs> is Android a tablet? Android is a telephone or it is a tablet. Um, the, there is, um, Android is also a laptop computer. Um, but the laptop com computer is based on the Android operating system, but it, it's, uh, it's a full-on computer um, with a few changes, okay? So you can get a Google, uh, Google tablet or a, a Google computer laptop, but, uh, at, which runs Android. But I'd stay away from them for a while. I mean, I'd, I'd want something like that to get broader into the market. It's less than 1% right now. What the Android is? Uh, the the uh, Google computer, oh. which is running Android. It's less than 1% of the market. I'd stay away from it. Any other questions? Yes? We uh, just switched uh, from Bell to Source. Oh, you <laughs> lucky people. <laughs> And uh, as far as the security, we, you know, we had security, McAfee with Bell. And yep. Now, I'm assuming that's null and void. What would you suggest that we do as far as security? Okay. Um, you change from Bell to Source, and you will shortly be changing from Source to Rogers. You have the Rogers um, modems in your houses already. It's just that they're still running on the Source servers. Um, I don't win, Fred. When are they going to? He said March, April. Yeah. March. Of next, of next, That's next year. That one guy was saying, yeah. Yeah. I thought, oh. um, I thought it was going to be sooner. It could be. Yeah. I thought it was going to be sometime in the winter. But okay, it's not immediate. Let's put it that way. It's not going to happen next week. Um, the computer you have, if it if it has Windows Defender, is good enough. Uh, Windows Defender will take care of just about everything that any of the other paid uh, applications will take care of unless you want to spend a whole bunch of money. Um, does Windows Defender come with every Windows operator? Or that yes, it now? does. Uh, if, you ha if you have uh, Windows uh, Vista, we have Windows 8. Okay, it came, came on their standard. The thing that you have to do is to go into the computer and unload any other antivirus programs you have to activate Windows, uh, Windows Defender. Windows Defender will divine whether you're using a, a third-party antivirus like um, Avast or Norton or any of the others, and it will just get out of the way. It won't start. It'll say, okay, you paid for this. Go ahead. Have some fun. But if they all go away, if you make them, if you delete them from the computer, 
then uh, Windows Defender divines that you don't have antivirus and it turns itself on. Yes? Okay, Windows Defender. Is it supposed to scan itself or yeah. do you have to go in and scan it? Um, it is supposed to be standing between you and the internet. If something gets onto your computer, it will know it right away and try and delete it or repair it. But it's, it, it's not proactive. In other words, it can't look at a web page and say, oh, there's something here I don't like. No, no, I'm talking when you, you open the Windows Defender. Yeah. And you've got your screen there. And it'll show when the last scan was. Yes. And it'll say, okay, it's not scanning every day. Oh, it's, it's not going to. Oh, okay. That's what I'm yeah, it's not going to. Yes. This is actually the first time I've heard the word Windows Defender. So I have Norton uh, oh. security, so okay. should I get rid of it and stop paying every year for Norton? Oh, yes. and just well, uh, what are you using it on? On the computer. Uh, what, uh, were you XP? Windows XP? No, uh, Windows 10. Windows 10. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, What's the best analogy I can use here? Belt and suspenders. Or both. <laughs> I, not belt or, oh. belt and. Oh. <laughs> okay. If you are uh, of a mind that um, you want to have that paid protection, sure, keep paying for Norton. But I must tell you that I don't think that Norton is any better at protecting your computer from viruses than Windows Defender. Now I'm going to say this again for the new folks. Old folks, I've said it almost every other week. Um, a virus is a different thing than a program. A virus, when it gets onto your computer, will try and do certain things. That's by definition, that's what they do. They look around and they will make a copy of themselves. As a virus would. You know, a, a biological virus, as soon as you're infected, it makes a copy of itself. Then it looks around for any place that it can plant that copy. So you've got a cold, you're next to him, you've got a cold. You got it from him. You got it from his virus. Yeah, SWAT. Okay, that's what a virus is. It looks around for another host, another computer on your system. Or when you uh, connect to the internet, it may have an opportunity to connect to other computers on the internet. That's a virus. A program that just downloads in the background while you're at a website is just that, a program. It's what we call malware, adware, scumware. Okay? Scumware, yeah. Um, these programs will download in the background and the next time your computer turns on, the program will load and activate and all of a sudden you can't get on the internet uh, for ads popping up all over. Or um, it will load a program onto your computer that you don't want, like uh, these PC help programs, okay? Um, there are hundreds of them. Uh, and they get on your, your computer, they've downloaded in the background, they've loaded themselves in the background, and your antivirus doesn't know a damn thing about them because they are not doing virus-like activity. They're just a program which you have to remove manually. Okay, Some of them are uh, deep-seated that you have to use tools to unload them. Uh, but so here we go with um, Norton versus or any paid antivirus service versus Microsoft's Windows Defender. 
Windows Defender will take care of all viruses that it knows about, as Norton would. It doesn't know about these programs, and neither does Norton. Okay, so you, you get something on your computer that's making a go funny, you say to yourself, well, why didn't Norton get it? It doesn't know anything about it. It's just a program. Should, you, should we not have a vast on um, that? Here again, a vast is, um, is, a, is a free service. There's a paid version. Um, but if you have um, the modern operating system of Windows 8 or Windows 10, uh, you really don't have to put a vast on it because Windows Defender is going to do exactly the oh, same I don't thing. Have XP, so yeah, so keep using it, please. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'll take your so, question. So, are you saying that the um, Windows Defender is virus only, or it also looks at malware and that? Other it stuff? knows about some kinds of malware. So, if you if you wanted to get something that was more inclusive for protecting okay the, the inclusive thing to get um, to protect your computer from malware spyware adware and scumware is malware bytes b y e t s b y t e s malware bytes what about the paid version um, the paid the paid version, now here's an interesting thing. I said there was, uh, uh, these programs were not proactive. They don't go out and look at web pages before you get the stuff from them. Malwarebytes does. So if you go to a web page, Malwarebytes looks at it before you even get there and says, okay, there's stuff on here that you're not going to like. Don't go there. Norton will do that too. To some degree. Yeah. To some degree, uh, it it uses a secondary program to do that, um, as does McAfee and all the rest of them. Um, but uh, Malwarebytes will uh, the paid version will um, is proactive. The free version you just run it once a week, and if you got anything during that time, it will take care of the problem. Yes. Why is my malware kicking in like a startup every time I go on the computer? I haven't even done anything yet, and malware is sitting there in my face wanting to scan immediately. Malware bytes? Yes, even before, yes, run free malware bytes, even before I go on the internet or anything. It just kicks in it's like a startup almost. Oh, um, it may be sitting in the startup folder. Okay, all right. Okay, so go to your startup folder. Right. Um, click on all programs yeah. and under the list of programs you'll have the folders there and Malwarebytes may have moved from its location here uh, on the computer Malwarebytes, there it is, that's yeah. the program somehow or other it may have gotten moved to the startup folder all right, so go, into the startup and see go into startup and see if it's there I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, two o'clock, folks. Um, our time is up now. I'm going to uh, first of all, for all of you new folks, I want you to come up and get one of my cards, uh, my business card. My number is on it. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, I give a special rate to the village for my service. Uh, ordinarily, I charge ninety bucks an hour to come to your home. The village is half that. Okay, 40. Yeah. Um, if you. Yes. Could I have everyone write their email address down and hand it to me? And that way I'll have their version of it. You got Bob's got to make them down, write them down. Yes, I, I, yeah. Uh, your, uh, your email address is very important to us because, um, as, I, as I said before, I'm videotaping these sessions and once I've edited the videotape I will put it up on the internet and send you an email link to it a link and email to this video where you can go back and watch it over and over again um, and um, explain to you how to get to this link all the time and and uh, all of the neat stuff you have to do yes one last question all the knowledge
language that I'm hearing here. People are really into it. Congratulations, especially to you. In my case, I got a, an iPad and I don't know how to use it. I have a Google Talk that I use for internet and email. Those are the only two things that I would be using it. Is there a chance that I can use this because my table computer is already old and failing? Yes, so yes. We can, we, we can set your iPad up with your email address, your email account, and I, I can give you a quick lesson on how to move around on the internet on your iPad. Okay, but uh, I'll have to come to your home to do that um, because, like I said, I don't have an iPad of my own that I can. But it's I can. Not included in the lessons here. There's. Uh, um, no, the the reason I say that is once I've got you once I've got you started on the iPad, I've got your email address in there, and you're getting email on it, and I've showed you how to move around on the internet. Okay. Um, from there on, all you should have for me is questions about your iPad. But setting it up, that's the problem. I can't set it up here. I can't set it up during a lesson. And it's too difficult a lesson for me to say, okay, you do this, this, and this, and by the time you get home, it's gone. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for coming, and uh, hope to see you all again next week. That's Computer Club Listen for today. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.